Welcome to the Amazon Legends Podcast, where we have real stories about making it big on Amazon. Our guests are CEOs of large companies and entrepreneurs who became powerful sellers, also experts specializing in helping sellers, and both former and current Amazon employees who will give us an insight from behind the scenes. Here's your host, Nick Urison. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Amazon Legends. My guest today is someone you would never guess. He was a student of how to be a professional umpire. So he graduated from a professional umpire school. And after working as a baseball professional, he spent over a decade in the Amazon universe building brands, building companies. He is currently the president of See How Sports Marketing. And when he's not working, he's passionate about his family, especially his 12-year-old daughter. And uh, he's also a professional sports agent. So anybody who wants to know about uh, this kind of stuff, uh, he's the man. He represents four NFL players. So this guy is not to be discounted easily. So he'll beat you in the Amazon game and he'll beat you in the, in the sports game. So, so with that, uh, everybody, welcome to the show. Uh, Casey Howen. Welcome to the show, Casey. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Casey. So uh, it's great to have you here. So you, your, your specialty is really scaling businesses. Correct. So when you and I discuss, you pick up a business and then you grow it. You blow right. the hell out of it. So um, tell us, how does a business scale? Well, just to give you a little bit of perspective there, Nick, too. Um, so see how sports marketing, the way we scale a, a company, especially the designed around the Amazon world, um, there's lots of startups, there's lots of widgets out there that are great widgets, um, but the designer, the company, whoever is in charge of that, may not either have the sales force, the marketing department, um, or the analytical team to really get themselves from a great product out to the world. Um, so what we do as a turnkey agency, um, we handle whatever they need. So we're, we are boutique, we're small, um, which allows us to very much help our client get in that um, world and we can dive in and be, and be who they need right away. So. What we do is a lot of times we have to take over their entire sales team. So we do all the metrics for them. We so, uh, hold on. Let me interrupt sure. you here. No, please. Because what I want to do is I want to make sure that uh, because, you know, you, uh, unfortunately, the know how your time does not scale. Right. So. Correct. Uh, and not everybody can have you uh, as their wingman, so to speak. Correct. So why don't we just lay down the principles of how, what are some things that a business should be doing to scale? And uh, alongside that, obviously, those are the things that you are going to, you, you help businesses with. Uh, but what should be there, if you like, rule book, their roadmap in order to scale their business? Sure. Well, I, I would say the first thing that obviously in 2022, a large part of that is social media, having a platform, having a voice out there um, on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and then being able to link that um, to your Amazon platform. Um, so to scale, really, it's one of those things to where, especially now with the supply chain issue for a lot of products, um, scaling can be very difficult. And I've also seen companies too, to where if they get too big too fast um, and get over their skis, so to speak, um, that could be a challenge too. But as far as what to do, it's really focus on what you're good at and let people that um, do this like myself as a living, take care of the things that you don't have any expertise in. And I think that's the, the very basic key for, for scaling. Just do what you're good at and then find other people that can help you with the rest of the process. Well, that that's such a such an important thing because a lot of the the cases entrepreneurs are go getters, right? So they are visionaries. They come up with a product, and then the next thing is they are taking on everything. I, I actually have a client uh, I, I started working with about uh, 
six weeks ago. So this is a lady who had a great idea and doing very well. She was featured in, uh, in Today's Show, NBC, CNN, ABC, you name it. It's a very unique product. It's for kids. Um, it's an educational product. It's not a toy, but she doesn't know how to scale. So we started working and, and I said, okay, who, uh, did, I, I gave a, if you like a, a list of things that we need to go through. And, and I say, okay, so who's going to do this? And she goes, I can do that. And then, so, okay, on the first one, I'll, maybe this is something that, you know, nope. she's good. Very, at. very commonplace for. And for the that. next thing, uh, uh, how about this? Well, I can do that. Uh, I can, listen, you're not doing anything. I said to her, uh, you're not doing anything. The goal here is for you not to be doing anything, but decide who does what. Right. So yep. that's what you're getting at. Right. So identify what you're good at and then delegate the rest. Absolutely bring in the professionals because you cannot afford to fail as a small company. You're taking on the big boys. Right. So how can you do a mediocre job? And to expand on that quickly, you're exactly right. What I've noticed is most small companies, and that's what we focus on as far as getting them to scale, um, they come from a startup, they come from a passion, it comes from somebody's bread and butter, it comes from their, um, you know, it's their baby, so to speak. So they do have a lot of trouble and just instinctual background and not giving up control. They want to do it all because that's how it started at the kitchen table or, you know, wherever it is. So then once you have to scale, you have to let the experts do what they're good at. So you're exactly right. So you mentioned social media. So let, let's uh, let's create the anatomy of a scale, so to speak. So what are those pieces that uh, that you need to put on your radar screen as pieces of your infrastructure that needs to be built so sure. that they are built in a way that you can scale without having to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So, right. Sorry, as far as that goes, the, the social media part is, I mean, it's not easy by any means, but it's very cost effective, especially for a small business. It doesn't take a, it takes time, but it doesn't take a lot of capital to, to get your social media platform up and running. And whether it's the Amazon team themselves or the Amazon customer, or even brick and mortar to that point, having a social media platform just gives your brand and your company legitimacy. Um, it gets your word out there for you, but I mean, consumers now are smarter than they've ever been. So when they go to do their research, um, even if they're going to buy it off of Amazon, one click and done, what we've shown is over 70% of those customers are going to go look on the company website or go look for, you know, more than just Amazon reviews. So um, that is a definitely an easy, easier way to scale. Um, and then, you know, moving on from there, the number one thing that we see is, uh, like I alluded to earlier, the supply supply chain issue, and that also ties back into uh, managing your resources, managing your capital. Um, if you can have the best product in the world, but if you you know you don't have the funding to to get it out there, um, you know you're going to hurt your brand by not being able to deliver to the customer. So that's an important part too. Okay, so. You mentioned two very important parts. I want to, for the listeners' benefit, I want to turn them into actionable uh, sure. steps that they can take. So let's discuss the social media part. Social media, what you are really uh, telling everyone, the underlying message is create your own following, right? That's what you're saying. Do right. not just trust on not not trust. Do not just rely on the the clicks that you're gonna pay for on Amazon right. or on Facebook or on Google to bring them to your listing to make a purchase. Create your own following so that you can make offers, you can invite them, whatever. Uh, but most important, you can. Build your own credibility, right? That's what you are getting at in the end. Yep. And one of our best customers that we work with, um, they have a great social media following um, and they have a great website, 
but all of their sales, all of their sales are still run through Amazon. So just because, I mean, letting Amazon take care of what they're good at, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, part of the scaling process. Amazon is good at certain things. Um, they're not great at other things. So you have to rely on the social media to really kind of give your brand some depth and give it um, as wide of a reach as you can possibly get. Because it's sometimes it's not easy just to be on the first page of Amazon, right? You search whatever the widget is. It's not an easy thing always to be on that first page. Um, so if you can direct people to Amazon more passively um, with your social media channels, you're really going to help that analytical thing start to build. The Amazon monster is going to grow. Um, and then that will help you down the road to get you know, in front of more viewers just on the Amazon platform. Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple of important points in it's the benefits of this, this platform that I think it's worth mentioning. First and foremost, let's assume that you're launching a new brand. Mm -hmm. Let me back up. You need to really analyze the, the picture, the big picture in three different aspects and then decide which one describes you the best because that will define the kind of uh, steps you need to take in order to gain the credibility uh, that you need. First one, if you are launching a brand new company, so in other words, it's a brand new seller account with Amazon. It's a brand new company. So that's one, brand new company. Second one, in a brand new company, you're launching a brand new brand, new brand. So new company, new brand that is clearly different than an existing company launching a new brand versus right. Right. a new company launching a new brand the third one is a new listing so now there is a difference between an existing brand launching a new listing there is no there is no history there's no nothing as far as amazon concerned that asin stands on its own right right but at the same time you know, you got something that you can leverage here because the brand is already on Amazon brand registry. You, you have your uh, existing A plus pages that you can uh, leverage and things like that. Uh, but the listing is new. So therefore, things to do in each case are different. And the extent of it is, is a lot more. So um, would you, first of all, would you agree with that kind of, analysis and then uh, approach i totally i totally agree 100 nick and the the thing there is you know obviously with amazon and the back end being so analytical um it is tough i mean i don't think most people with a a new company understand that it's not just two clicks and you're done to get a successful product on amazon so yes definitely having somebody in your corner um, that knows what that world looks like um, and again, it's all different too. Not, not every company is the same based on what they're selling, um, you know, what their inventory looks like, what their, their cash flow looks like. Um, but to be successful and to get back to the scale question, yes, you definitely need to understand the difference between new company, new product line, and then whether it's just a one-up or you come out with the new product in red and blue you know, kind of a thing. They're all unique for sure. And it's it's an, not an easy thing to jump into and understand. And something that you uh, mentioned that I, I caught on to is with your background and expertise and my background expertise, the amount of hours that we've put into understanding, and I wouldn't quite say perfecting, but understanding and fine tuning um, those processes and what that looks like for different brands and product lines, is not an easy thing to learn. It's just like anything else. You have to put the time in and understand it. So yeah, yeah exactly. that is very true. Yeah, definitely. So um, let's talk a little bit about the social media because I want to I wanna give people something they can take away and then use. Uh, so having those three scenarios, new company, new brand, and new listing. So share with us some ideas what kind of content they can post. Sure. In so in, in, 
in my world, coming from the consumer goods, um, Sea Health Sports Marketing, we mainly focus on hunt fish camp and then team sports, baseball, basketball, football, softball. Um, so anything you can do to create lifestyle posts. And what I mean by that is, you know, people using the product, you know, actually show the product being used for what it's intended to be. Um, that really resonates. And what we found, you get a lot more clicks, likes, and shares, rather than just a picture of the product, show it, show the product being used for what it's intended to. So that's probably the biggest takeaway. And I've seen companies very, um, very much stray from that and their product and their social media platform has like a really cold and stale look to it. So if you can actually have, you know, the product being used as, as it's intended, um, you're going to be a lot better off painting that picture for the consumer and telling them why they, you know, why they could use and benefit from that product. Mm -hmm. So as far as social so, media goes, that's, you know, that's, that's my biggest takeaway. And then other than that, um, there's a fine line between over posting too. Um, you don't want to, if you have a follower, you gain them as a follower, you don't want to necessarily bombard them with way too many posts because then they're just going to unfollow you because it's clogging up their feed. So how many is too many? I mean, our rule of thumb is two to three a day, most as far as your posts go. Um, and, you know, and I'm saying you can use the same post for Facebook as you can for, or for um, Instagram as you can for Twitter. Um, but more than that, and you just kind of basically mentally wear out your customer. Um, it's too much. So two, two to three a week. Yeah. And any particular days that work better than others? Good question. Really good question. Um, for the most part, what we found is to spread it out. Um, weekends, weekends are not good, even though everyone is usually, you know, if they have a nine to five, they're not working, but most people are consuming their social media early in the morning over a cup of coffee um, or, you know, at night before they go to bed. So, but stay like, so like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of a thing is what we found is, is probably the most successful platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, these, I mean, you're giving very good tips. Uh, let's now talk about close the uh, loop in mm -hmm. terms of measuring the success of all these efforts. So how do you know this is working? What is well, the, I, the measure? So as far as the social media part, obviously the it's intended to drive sales, right? So if your sales are there, it's probably working to some extent. Um, and then from there, it's really user interaction where the, you know, cause all of these social media platforms have their own metrics and their own ways to measure things, but it's all about, you want, you just want views. You want people to consume it. You want them to view it. So views and likes, and not even so much on likes, but just views, getting people to put eyeballs on it, you know, and eventually it'll be in the back of their brain. And whenever they're ready to purchase whatever category you're working in, you have brand recognition because they've seen it multiple times across different platforms yeah well what you just said is so important so if you if you run something once you know consumers want to see you in uh, i believe the number i heard was seven seven times before they make a decision on it so it's a good idea to be running to be consistent and and, and make an appearance do you use Amazon's attribution in this process at all or not? Absolutely. And again, you know, me focusing on startups and small brands, um, I think that's very important. That's a good point. Um, letting Amazon do their job for you with that absolutely helps a, a ton. Okay. So this brings me to my favorite part of this, uh, this, this whole experiment, so to speak, of social media. So we started from uh, how to use social media. So we're not talking about paid stuff. We're talking sure. about posting content. Um, for the, uh, and then we decided that we are going to share lifestyle pictures. So in other words, the product being used by people. Uh, and, and then we're going to do that two, three times a week. We're not going to overdo it. And then we are going to track what is coming to our site. I mean, to our listing. 
mm -hmm. from those. We're not talking about looking at the, the Facebook metrics or anything else. What we're looking at is the Amazon attribution metrics yes. that show us how much say how my how many uh, unique sessions mm -hmm. and and how many orders were generated through those social media links which means that you have to create those links with the amazon attribution id so that you can identify Correct. so now this is all fine that brings the it closes the loop the measure that I like the most is your conversion rate. That, and exactly the conversion rate I mean. on the product listing page. So can you share with us some of your experience in how that conversion rate is impacted by using social media? Like for example, before and after, as you put it, you know, lifestyle or use cases. So uh, right. a client that's not using social media, achieving one conversion rate and after using social media, what kind of change? Can you, uh, do you have anything that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, I've seen conversion rates be five fold better with social media. Um, and then to get back to that, to, to get to the conversion rates um, through Amazon, the best way to do that is if, if I'm talking to a, a startup company and just giving them advice, um, when I sit down with them, find some influencers and it doesn't have to be, you know, famous people at all, but find somebody who has a true passion about what you do, um, provide them with a discount, provide them with product, make them an ambassador for your brand. Um, because then when you have those social media posts that you can share somebody else's post, um, it has a more authentic, more um, kind of hitting home moment. You can see people actually using the product where it doesn't always feel like an ad all the time, so to speak. Um, and I've noticed that really, really helps conversion rates as far as seeing actual people using the product, not just a staged photo shoot, which is important too, but actually getting the product into hands of people and then having them use that on their social media platform and then reposting their post um you'll see conversion rates jump very considerably okay so uh, there is a and there really is no definitive answer to uh, a question on which way is the best way to go so as you know people on amazon are there to buy a product so therefore they are searching and if you do your job the right way and then you do your keyword research and, and analyze and build your content around those keywords and then run paid campaigns on Amazon, uh, you will come up as sponsored listings. People will look at it, click on it, land on the product page and then make the purchase. Right. And what Amazon wants is high conversion because to them, uh, high conversion indicates that the product that the shopper searched for is a good product and it was acceptable to the, to the shopper so they didn't keep searching. Right. So achieving high conversion will then automatically get you ranked high you know, in, the, in those searches. Yep. And that's when you start to get, you know, at the bottom of the, the listing page, if they're shopping for a competitor's product, they click on a competitor's product, but you have a high conversion rate, you will be suggested at the bottom of that page. Um, right. People also, yeah, so definitely, yes. And that all ties back into um, the social media part of it. Having an authentic campaign makes that person then go to Amazon and search specifically for your product. And then your conversion rates jump considerably. Yeah. So, so now the 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 difficult decision to make is, and I've heard both sides of the argument. I just want to hear your take on it. So, it is quite likely that if you run paid ads on Amazon, people who will click on your product your listing that land on your product page are likely to buy. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. They're not just there looking. They're likely to buy. So therefore, your conversion rate is likely to be on the high side compared to a social media posting. Somebody, you know, scrolling through their Facebook posts, watching the reels and whatever, they come across your posting and they click on it. They're not necessarily looking to buy it. They just became interested. In fact, if you do such a great job and post these great little videos or great little uh, pictures with lifestyle representation, uh, they may click on it. And they let, now they are on your product page. Mm -hmm. But there is a much, much lower percentage of those people Correct. that click your listing that will become buyers. So therefore, right. your conversion rate will suffer. So therefore, the, the pro argument is, look, the more traffic, the better. And you can't be too concerned about conversion rate. You just need to see what's going on. And it's better to bring more people than not. And the other argument is, no, you're going to pay for clicks to achieve the, the kind of ranking and bestseller rank for your category, as well as the ranking for the search phrases. And then you're gonna lose it all and your rank will go you know, straight to the floor because you're bringing traffic that's irrelevant and, and your conversion rate drops. So what is your take on it? I, I, that's, a good, that's a good question. And I think they kind of run parallel to each other, um, especially in the infancy stage of a, of a product line or a company. Um, because you need to build that brand and the easiest way to do that from a financial standpoint for a new company is to utilize social media. Um, but yes, you, you definitely, if I had a $10 bill to spend, I would put eight of it into Amazon, um, paid search and $2 into social media because yeah. you're exactly right. The, the conversion rate is going to be there. And then as we all know, once Amazon gets rolling, it, I mean, it just kind of like a snowball rolling downhill, right? It just gathers momentum and grows yeah. and grows and grows kind of organically after you put a little bit of, you know, right. effort and money into it. So yeah, I would, I, I would say I lean towards Amazon, but the social media part is super important to build brand equity and build brand recognition. Yeah. So, you know, uh, this is, this happens to be one of my favorite questions because uh, what, what happens is everyone that I ask has a different kind of perspective, and then it adds one more, one more point of consideration, so to speak. And it's like adding more data points mm -hmm. to define an unknown. So I really like asking this question, and you also uh, presented something to consider. So what I'm hearing uh, just having heard other viewpoints and, and yours. Now what I'm saying, what I'm hearing is this, for a company, first of all, there is no answer for this question. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. It depends, right? Sure. It depends. Very so true. if you are, if you are it's, if it's a new listing, absolutely consider both. Do Correct. not rule anything out. Absolutely Correct. consider both. Put your paid ads on Amazon because even though they, you may not get much return, you'll get ranked up and the organic that will put you in a better place and you'll convert at a higher rate than yep. just instead advertising on Facebook. However, definitely get your brand awareness out there to create your own following. Also get your social media going. And, and then the key here is monitor through attribution so that you can see what is hitting your product page and what is converting and which channel is converting the most and the key thing so about those, yeah the key yeah. thing about those metrics and the attribution there is it allows a company to pivot too because like you were saying there's no absolute there's no correct answer for i mean because everything is different if you were coca-cola and came out with a new flavor, 
you would throw all your money at Amazon because you already have the brand recognition. But if you're a brand new product line, um, you know, you, you have to kind of mix and match and be, be hopefully nimble enough to say, hey, you know what, we tried this for two months and we need to kind of go to plan B. So, but that's where the yeah. analytics um, and the metrics from Amazon come into play very, very much. Exactly. Now uh, on this, we're still on the, the new listing mm -hmm. uh, scenario. So for new listings, another perspective that was given was, look, you have a new listing, you have no history, you have nothing, you have to throw everything at it and then watch the numbers, wherever the money is coming from, that's where you shift more. So uh, don't make rules about this, I'm, I'm gonna spend so much here and so much there and just allocate a, a, a budget for all channels and then set a time. It's not one day or two day or three days, give it enough time, usually two weeks, mm -hmm. watch what is the performance of external and internal mm -hmm. and then wherever the conversion is the highest immediately start to shift towards what is working and also you know it's not one or the other it's the degrees because you're going to have multiple different ways to bring traffic whether it's amazon or external uh, you just have to monitor which one is working which social media post is working the best and, right. and things like that now, in the case of an existing listing, that's a much, much more sensitive area because you can, in fact, risk losing your rank. So right. there you have to be more careful when you go to social media, you have to stay much closer to your metrics, how you are converting your attribution and everything else, and, uh, and then change accordingly. And if somebody in fact said that they've had this in fact they tried it when attribution first came out and and as you know there's also a program called brand referral bonus program yeah so when you link the two up the sales you generate from external traffic you get up to 10 percent back right so it's great they activated it the next thing is they're getting traffic and sales are nowhere near and they shut everything down and they just stuck to PPC because they were losing their BSR. Right. And that's where it goes back to that. You have to be able to pivot. You have to monitor it and you have to be able to take your time and resources and throw it at whatever the analytics are telling you is working. Yeah. And that's, that's where the hyper focus comes into play. Totally agree. Yeah. So this is great, uh, Casey. Uh, people don't really think about these things. They just want to get out there and post as much as possible. Right. And, and actually, sometimes less is more. So it's the conversion rate that you have to right. be focused on. Uh, okay. The thing, too, so, like, the thing, too, about an Amazon seller um, is finding that balance between focusing on the analytics and focusing on the product and focusing on the consumer. Um, right. So they're all very important. And again, it goes back to the conversation about is this a new listing, a new brand, a new product line? They're all different. Um, and, but you, you definitely need to understand all three of those things to be fully successful. Yeah. And, and by the way, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because if you are a new company altogether, you want to also showcase your company, your history, you know, your, your story, most right. important, your story, where the idea came from, uh, how did you uh, invent it or, or, you know, whatever the story of your brand is. Uh, and then link that to the company and then showcase that. But if you are a, already an established com uh, company and your brand has been around and you are launching a new product line, that's an easier one because automatically you're going to inherit that credibility. So you don't have to post as much or emphasize. Or in fact, in the pictures, you don't emphasize your corporate culture and uh, history and things like that. You can just focus on the product because there will be plenty of material out there uh, sure, about absolutely. your brand and your company. And the other part of that too, which we haven't touched on and I'll make it brief is what I call the me too products, meaning that you just, you're a copycat. You're making something to sell on Amazon that there's already 10 of. Then I would backtrack and say, I would spend virtually no money or time on social media and all of my money trying to get you know, what I call on that first page, on that search page on, on Amazon, because you don't have, you don't have anything that's necessarily unique. You just have 
your version of a toaster, call it, you know, so everyone yeah. knows what a toaster is. There's not a whole lot of brand loyalty to a toaster. So if you have a toaster that you want to sell on Amazon, I would put all of your money into paid search and keywords and things like that through Amazon and would not worry about social media at all. Yeah. I mean, that is something that I, uh, I'm glad actually you, you brought that up because those me too products, listen, I, I, I remember this, the most significant me too product when everything was going crazy uh, in the internet business, going way back to the beginning. Uh, for those who may remember as far back, it, still around there was a company called yahoo and <laughs> yahoo was the search engine yep and they had there was no search and it was 14 categories seven on one side seven on the other and you would simply click on those categories and see the listings of the companies under right. it yeah and the, and the most significant part of it was get listed under the right uh, category yep and their category structure was crazy. It was like a, a maze, you know, they cross linked company categories, blah, blah. That was the search engine. So 1994, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, Yahoo is, is the leader. And because Yahoo established itself as a search engine and established the concept of search engine, you had all kinds of search engine entrepreneurs. Search engine for porn industry, search <laughs> engine for vegetarian, search engine for yeah. the. So that's the typical me too. Right. Then along comes a little company called Google. I've heard of it. I've heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Google was so crafty. That's the perfect me too. Mm -hmm. So, so crafty with their positioning. They knew that being a search engine and then creating these categories for people to be listed under it is not it. What's important is to index content because without content, search engine has nothing. So they said, oh, we need content first. So how do we get content? Well, where do you find content? For free libraries yeah universities they mm -hmm. went to libraries and universities and they said let us be the search engine for your site mm -hmm. there was no google.com but if you ever went to a university or a library you know a new york library you went to new york library website and there was a search ny library box and underneath it said powered by google mm -hmm. and then you went to harvard university search powered by Google. They completely spread all over, collected it. And, uh, and, and then one day they announced to the public, we are opening. Everybody is, well, everybody in my circle, uh, curious to see. So they open, we go to google.com. It's a, it's a search box. What kind of a homepage? So yeah. those days, bells and whistles that we see on homepages, it's mm -hmm. just the same. And it's to, to this day, it's a search box. So, but by the time they launched, they had so much content already and they had the indexing nailed and the rest is history. And Google- well, Yeah, I mean, Google's gone from that small company to now Google is a noun and a verb. So, yeah. you know, yeah, it, I mean, it, it's part of everyone's every, almost everyone's yeah. everyday life. So, yeah. but yeah, that's a perfect example of a, a me too. And to that point too, what I would tell, you know, Amazon sellers, um, whether you are reselling a product or you're a brand, you don't have to be first to market to be best in show on Amazon right. at all. Right, exactly. And uh, so uh, the, the key word that I would uh, say is position. You mm -hmm. need to position yourself. And one thing I did with one of my clients is uh, he was in supplement business. And as you know, supplement is very competitive, very hard. And his was about, you know, for uh, gym, you know, fitness enthusiasts. So for bones and things like that. So, so I said, listen, we had to have some kind of a differentiator and your differentiator has to be, cannot be your price, never compete on price. 
and also uh, create some kind of a differentiator that's that means something, not just a gimmick. So what we did was we positioned them for CrossFit uh, people, and sure. we changed the labeling on it, keyword research, everything became focused. Uh, he started appealing to CrossFit communities and, and groups and things like that. So, uh, I mean, there's always a way. Uh, don't be discouraged. But if you can help it, try to avoid the Me Too kind of products. But it, you, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I would just find a way to differentiate yourself and never negotiate on the price. Always be a premium. That's totally. my lesson, at least that I learned. I it go, a quick story goes back to the uh, the chocolatier who had candy bars on the shelves and couldn't sell a single one. Took them back off the shelves, wrapped them in gold aluminum foil, doubled the price, and couldn't keep them in stock. So it yeah. goes back to your whole thing about price. You you have to definitely position yourself to be um, a premium product it, whenever you can, and unfortunately or fortunately depending on who's listening price in a lot of people's mind means premium so um, that's i guess that's my yeah that's yeah. my story there well you know ultimately this is what i learned uh, people will associate value with price mm -hmm. if you make it cheap they're not going to value it uh, you just have to deliver the goods Yes. You know, if you, you can't just say, oh, we are a premium, just putting the word premium in the title is not going to make you premium. You Correct. have to have premium photos. You have to have premium A plus pages. Now yeah. they have premium A plus pages, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to use the, so uh, make sure everything you have is premium. Offer premium value bundles instead of selling single, create packs and bundles and That's offer a, a higher value. So, I mean, there are many, many ways to offer, uh, to establish that premium value for yourself as perception. Uh, That's great. But, yeah. So, I want to move on to the other thing that you mentioned. I mean, there's many ways to scale, but what we are hitting here is really the promotional aspect of it mm -hmm. to establish the brand equity and the awareness. And uh, the second piece without which there is no business and there's the supply chain. Right. So you mentioned finance. So one of the things that, that I've seen is, let's say that you are a seller and you've got $10,000 in the bank account. You put as your capital. Mm -hmm. And I say to you, can I have $1,000? You can ask me a zillion questions, and in the end, you're probably not going to give me anything because the money is limited, right? And right. you've just started a company. So then you turn around and you buy $10,000 worth of inventory. You bring it in. Inventory goes on the shelf. My experience is most sellers do not track their inventory value. value and how many they have left in stock real time. That's a good point. I mean, it, so we have a client who went through that same struggle. Um, they were on the top of their page um, and top of their listing on multiple keyword searches through Amazon and through a little bit of fault of their own, but also some supply chain issues ran out of inventory before they could reorder any inventory. And it just, their, their rankings just plummeted um, because they didn't have anything in stock. So it, you know, it, it just plummeted through the analytics. Um, so it is definitely important to manage your inventory. Amazon has great programs that you can use to, to basically they'll do that for you. But a lot of people don't think about that. They just get focused on sales and not on you know, keeping the ball rolling, like we were just talking about, keeping that snowball headed downhill. Yeah. So the, I just want to bring this up. It, it's not the most attractive aspect of selling because it's not about selling, but it's about your inventory. Uh, let's say that you are a company, you started, 
I absolutely advocate selling exclusively on Amazon at the beginning. Establish your inventory management. So now here is the thing that's that makes it complicated. First and foremost, you have to know how many pieces are left at Amazon, at the FBA facility. That number you will pick up from Amazon. That's easy. And there are systems that will track how many pieces you have left. Worst case scenario, you have Seller Central. But by tracking, I don't mean logging on to Seller Central and looking at the number. That's not what I mean. What I mean is numbers integrated into reporting that you're watching. Because if you do well, they are constantly ticking down and you need to know what the order order flow rate is and you need to compare that against how many pieces you have at Amazon. Now, you also have inventory if you set up that way and you really should either in your own warehouse or in your garage or at a 3 p.m. So now here is another number. How many pieces you have at FBA? Yep. How many pieces do you have at 3 p.m.? Number three, how many pieces you have an open PO for and when they are going to be delivered? Right. So now, how many pieces you're selling, depending on your lead time, let's say you have two-month lead, lead time. So mm -hmm. how many pieces you're going to sell in two months? Minus how many pieces you have at Amazon, minus how many pieces you have at Amazon minus how many pieces you have on a PO, that difference is the difference you have to cover for. If you are ending up, you know, negative, I mean, obviously you, you add up the PO plus the warehouse and right. plus, and then take away the, your order flow rate. If that is a negative number, that means you're short in supply. You have to Correct. order, right? Correct. So, uh, I'm just setting the whole thing up and yeah, I want to you see painted, your take. You so, painted a great picture there. And that, that is, and I would say in my experience working with clients, that's one of the trickiest things for, if you are the owner of this product, this is your baby and you invented it or you put your time into developing it. Um, it's the most important thing, but it's also the last thing that people really tend to think about or dive into. Um, you know, so that's where it goes back to kind of bring this full circle, you know, find a team member, find a third party company, um, dive into the analytics on Amazon and like focus on that and let somebody do that for you. That's good at it. Because if you don't have the correct inventory, whether you've got a hundred times too much or you're out of inventory and nothing in the pipeline with an open PO, um, and nothing in the warehouses, I mean, you're going to cripple yourselves either way, right. whether it's too much or too little. So the, the whole inventory management aspect is crucial, crucial. Yeah. So this is the kiss of death for me that I always tell people and that they must monitor. Now, very few sellers that I run into know the value of their inventory in real time, the way I described. Very few sellers have the tracking on what's at Amazon, what's at home or at 3PL, What's on a PO? Therefore, what do I need? In other words, this is called demand planning. They right. don't plan their demand. They just simply make sure that they have enough inventory. So that means to keep buying, keep buying so that you don't run out of stock. Because if you run out of stock, it's your sales stop. So they don't want to do that either. So they keep buying. So uh, this is where things go completely out the window. And it can be very dangerous game to play. Let's assume that you are generating a healthy margin, net profit mm -hmm. every month. What would that be according to you know, your experience with your clients? What would, they, by the way, net margin means take away the product cost mm -hmm. from the sale, take away Amazon commission, take away the shipping and storage fees, take away the advertising, as a percentage of sales, mm -hmm. what is left is what I call as the net margin. Of course, your overheads come out of it, but forget the overheads because they are fixed. They're supposed to be fixed. So sure. what, what is a healthy margin to you? After all that said and done, and there is a little bit of variance there depending on the price of the, of the consumer good being sold. Um, but 
if it's a just a, a general consumer good after baking all that stuff out, I like to look for 25% with the products that I deal with. Um, after assuming that we've subtracted the same amount of things as far as your brain versus my yeah. brain, um, you know, 25%. Um, I always like to tell people that um, if you can't keystone your product in a turn and burn Amazon world, um, you're not going to do very well. Keystoning meaning doubling the wholesale price versus the consumer price. Um, so 25% is a goal for me. And I guess I'd like to know in your experience, what you told your clients, what you've seen successful after subtracting all those same things out. Yeah. So the revenue model. So when I start with a client, the first thing I do is I look at their revenue model and generally mm -hmm. speaking, nine, not nine out of 10, we throw it out and we rebuild it from scratch. Right. So, uh, and I have a template I use uh, for anybody listening, uh, reach out anytime and I'll be happy to share my template. It's all color coded. There are three buckets. First cost of goods sold. That is the product cost, landed product cost. I want that to be um, no more than 30% of the selling price. So now 30% right off the bat is gone. You're going to pay 15% to Amazon. Mm -hmm. Now we are up to 45%. Depending on how bulky and heavy the item is, which brings you down to picking the kind of item that you want to sell, you don't want heavy stuff. Uh, right. Then I usually allow for it 15%. So Fair. that means price point is key. So I typically ask people, do not go for products that are less than $38. Uh, ideally, you want a high ticket item, and 38 is not, not high, but it's uh, medium. It's high enough uh, without being high, but low enough to be easy purchase. Uh, so as long as you stay with those metrics, 30 plus 15 plus 15, 60%. So that leaves us with 40. And I tell them, be prepared to spend anything between 10 to 20%. Uh, yep. on advertising that leaves us with 20 to 30 percent net 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 margin if you can't keep this you've got a broken revenue model that doesn't mean not selling the product all it means is looking to create the bundles now amazon has this virtual bundling you can experiment with so that's why that's what i do so you say 25 i say 20 it's pretty much the same thing so now right. so here is my kiss of death for the business so let's assume that you have the 25%, very good margin. And let's assume that you are generating $100,000 a month in sales. I mean, uh, in net profits. Net profit, okay. Net. So people listening to us, now they're going to say 25% net margin. I'm making 100 grand a month net. I have nothing to worry about. Couldn't be more wrong. So Correct. here is the kiss of that. Now, if you're generating $100,000 in sales, we know being 25% of the total, you sold $400,000. Right. And what you sold, you bought at 30% at, what is that, 3,400? It's $120,000, right? So let's call it um, $120,000. So now, $120,000 worth of inventory gone out the door already that month. In order to have $120,000 worth of inventory in stock, you had to be carrying how much? For me personally, comfortable to take that number times three. Um, but I mean, it it's, depends, on the, depends on the company too. So, um, all right. So let, three is a good number because usually you have two month lead time. So three, okay. What does that mean? 120 times three, 360,000. You know what that means? For four months, almost four months, you're gonna make that hundred grand and not put a penny in your pocket just to finance right. your inventory. Right. So now if 30% of your inventory is stale, it's not selling. You don't even know that you're carrying $400,000 worth of inventory or it's lost 
or it's in transit, it's delayed. You know how you compensate for it? By buying more. So now you're carrying 500,000, yeah. 600,000. So this is the situation. I tell people, you ever find yourself asking the question, you know, I don't understand. We're growing, we have healthy margins, but we never have any money in the bank. And we can't find, and bank won't lend us any more money. Right. Yeah, and then you start talking about, you know, having to factor your purchase orders and now, you know, the factory that's making your product for you is getting a bigger chunk because, you know, they're giving you extended terms or whatever that looks like. Yeah, it's, I mean, you're exactly right. That can totally be the kiss of death if you don't fully grasp that whole money management concept. And God, by the way, the picture we painted is at very good margins. If you are running at 15% net, now you are carrying six months worth. I mean, who's going to survive, right? I mean, you're going to, this is where I say your revenue model, that's where it started. And your inventory management is so critical. You don't do this right. You are going to go bankrupt. There is no question because you can't find money to fund somebody's salary for six months. You, right. can, you, can, add, you can beg people to wait for another month or two months. But there is not enough money in the world to fund your inventory when you're not even managing it. It's the example, you know, $10,000, you hold on to it. When it becomes inventory, you have no idea. I just don't get it. No, it's, that's the whole thing too, Nick. If you don't have the inventory to sell, you have nothing, you right? It's going to be tough to stay afloat. So, yeah. So give us some, uh, uh, some tips. Uh, for people that they can avoid this problem. So what do you usually recommend for them to, uh, to do in their business? I mean, it, I always, like it goes back to the whole scaling thing. Um, I guess the expectation is people wanna go from $0 to a million dollars overnight. Um, and that can be another kiss of death too, because you get way too out in front of yourself. You get overextended financially. Um, so I like to take the approach of just slow methodical growth like don't expect it to be the biggest thing on amazon overnight grow steady grow within your means um and but yeah to your point i mean throw as much money as you can at inventory if things are working i mean you don't there's, you don't want to have a warehouse with you know a million units in it either and they're not moving um but at the same time if you have a product and you have the sales history and you can tell where it's at Throw your throw your money at product because yeah. without product you can't you can't do anything. Yeah, great, Casey. This was great. So um, let's learn a little bit about you. Uh, so sure. tell us where did you grow up? So I grew up in a very rural farm town on the Iowa Minnesota border, um, and then yeah, that took me to the, the University of Northern Iowa. And now I my family we live in uh, Iowa City, Iowa. So I, I went from a Panther to a Hawkeye. Um, so yeah, I lived in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth for a decade, uh, spent a couple years in Southern California. Um, so, and then a few months in China, but that was just more managing factories, but yeah, home is Iowa city, Iowa. So middle, middle of the earth. So I introduce you as a, a graduate of professional umpire mm -hmm. school. So uh, was that something that you wanted to do from childhood? Or just came about? Baseball has always been a passion of mine. And then after I uh, got my bachelor's degree at Northern Iowa, um, yeah, I just had the opportunity when I was done playing baseball to go to umpire school and did well there. Spent a couple of years in the minor leagues, running around the country, working for peanuts and stale hot dogs. And then got a, got a call to join the, the San Diego Padres front office. And so that's when I was in Southern California. And then, um, you know, at the time this was back uh, when Freddie and Franny were giving home loans to anyone that would look at them. So, um, you know, the one bedroom, one bath house in Southern California for $600,000 really kind of wasn't very appealing at the time. Um, so moved back to Iowa and got my start in, in retail. Um, and then that just kind Why of- retail? What's that? Why retail? It was just a, it was a sporting goods store. Um, so it was a passion of mine and it was just a, a way to uh, kind of grow. I wanted, I knew I wanted to own my own sales and marketing firm. 
And I figured that if I couldn't understand retail from the brick and mortar level, it was going to be a gap in what my clients would need to understand because there is, you know, obviously we're focusing on Amazon, but a lot of sellers, once they get established on Amazon, there's some sort of pride issue in seeing your product on a, on a retail brick and mortar shelf. Right. So I, I wanted to understand that part of the sales world so I could, you know, be the best at what I'm trying to do. So why did you want your own sales and marketing firm? Um, it just always was something that I had a passion for and just wanted to carve out a niche. When I, you know, when I was leaving corporate America um, and I was in a regional sales manager role, I noticed that there was a gap in, everybody wants the big fish all the time. Everybody wants the big brands, the, the notoriety, that kind of a thing. And there's all these small companies that, need help because they don't have the infrastructure to do everything that we've talked about for the last hour. So being able to kind of carve out a niche in that world, and that's where I use the term boutique, because we're not the largest sales marketing firm on the planet, but we we have carved out our niche and you know we've gotten pretty proficient at, at what we're doing. So Casey, tell me, uh, so it's the underdog. You want to provide for the underdog. Why, why, why do you feel that? Where is that? Uh, I, you know, I think from a personal level, um, you know, growing up on a, on a farm in the middle of the Midwest, you know, um, the son of a, a corn farmer and a hog farmer, um, you know, going to a small school, there's just that kind of passion in me about the little guy. Um, and then from there, noticing that the little guy has more passion, especially in Amazon selling, than a lot of these big companies do, just because it's just, you're a number on a spreadsheet as opposed to an actual human being person. So I guess I enjoyed that part of it. And those success stories were always more um, rewarding when you can help somebody grow from, you know, basically nothing to, you know, super successful. And I always tell my clients, um, I hope in one year you don't need me. Like I hope in one year we're right. we're terminating our contract because you've gone and you know you have got money in the bank now. You've got the infrastructure to build out your own team internally. Um, and, you know sometimes clients stick us around because of how much we've helped. But I'm at the same time if you don't need me in a year, I'll take that as the biggest compliment possible. So uh, when you were growing up as a kid. Yes. Did anybody like take care of you like you because you were the underdog then, right? So did you did you have that kind of situation where you know you felt oh, I you know I'm I'm receiving help and you know you appreciated that? Did you sure. have that? I mean, time? my parents were very supportive about that kind of stuff and you know a good family there. And I guess to take care of it, the story is when I was ten, I wanted to buy a baseball card, and I told my mom I need fifteen dollars for this baseball card. And she's like, go earn it yourself. So, you know, whether that's mowing lawns or shoveling snow or whatever. So long story short, by the time I was 10, I'd started my own pumpkin patch business, started with just like a small garden, selling them to the local grocery store. And then by the time I sold it, when I was in high school and getting busy, I had enough money in the bank to pay for four years of college on my own. So, oh my God. Yeah. And a so car. your mother, your mother uh, really gave you a lesson that you carry. Yeah, your guiding principle for not only for your. I mean, obviously you've done well for yourself, but now you are actually uh, paying it forward, so to speak. That you yeah. are instead of going after these big brands, you're going after the little guys who have a good vision and a good product and then you're taking them under your wings yep. that's very admirable and it all goes back to your mother for sure yeah she must be proud she is yeah for sure yeah so she's oh. it's a funny story but yeah it's it's she's it's a it's yeah it's one of those things every time i see a pumpkin or a pumpkin patch when i'm driving somewhere it's like yeah it goes right back to that yeah humble beginning but you know you must be proud Sure. Uh, if I, if you're not, you should be, because you. you've done you you've done very well. Because I mean, a lot of people, especially these days, you know, the, the relationship between kids and parents, and 
With this kind of hardship, the value of hardship, everybody wants everything yesterday for nothing. And, and so, you know, you, you not only did it, but you are now also helping others. So uh, helping others stand on their own feet. And so this is, uh, it's a very touching story. So uh, for me, really, it really inspires me. So anybody listening, there is your guy. You know, if you're struggling, you know, he's going to do it. Sure. Not because... I, mean, I, I, I always, I always tell companies too, you know, like when I first start talking to them, like, I'm not going to make a dollar till you make three. So, um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's very admirable. Uh, it's very admirable. This was great, Casey. So uh, share with us your contact information. How can people reach you? Sure. Um, you can reach me at my name at Gmail, which is C-A-S-E-Y-H-A-U-A-N at gmail.com. Um, we don't have a forward facing website on purpose because it's all about our clients. We take care of their websites, not our own. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, and we can, you know, hopefully in the, in the bio on the, on the podcast, you can, you know, put contact information there too, but I'd love Absolutely, to, yeah. love to yeah. reach out to anyone that, you know, has a question. I mean, uh, my phone and my email are always open. So I, I deal with clients around the world. So, you know sleep is not always an option and I'm happy to entertain any email or any phone call. Oh yes. Sleep is always secondary. So it is. Uh, yeah. With, uh, for anybody listening, uh, Casey's contact information will be on the webs on the website, uh, together with the episode and wherever else you see the episode, the information will be there. So and go ahead and, and reach out Casey. Uh, I respect everything you're doing and you delivered a lot of good stuff and thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And this brings us to the end of another episode, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Be sure and subscribe, rate, and review our show. And be sure and share an episode with a friend. And thank you so much for being with us today. We'll see you next week here on Amazon Legends.